Hi everyone, our last recording for this class, quite a doozy. We are going to be covering all of vascular technology. So this is talking about all of the vascular procedures that you would perform if you worked in a vascular lab that don't really have a direct connection to ultrasound. So they fall under the RVT um, registry. I guess was the word I was looking for, or certification, but that's why uh, the vascular exam is not really part of RDMS. Like it doesn't really focus solely on diagnostic ultrasound. It's talking about the technology that we can use to evaluate the vascular system. So this is kind of talking about some of those um, additional exams that you would be responsible for performing if you were to work in a vascular lab or a hospital that has a vascular lab. So some of these things you may have seen down at Newport, maybe at Coastal if you were there for a short period of time. Uh, but one of the main things that we're going to talk a lot about today is going to be Doppler segmental pressures and also plethysmography. So these are going to be really sort of abstract exams that I'm going to try my best to explain to you guys without actually having the equipment to demonstrate what that means. So kind of hang in there with me when we go through those. We're also going to be talking about penile imaging, why and how we perform that, photoplethysmography, also known as PPG. We're going to learn how we can evaluate digital pressures down in the toes. We can also do it in the fingertips, but mainly down in the toes. Transcutaneous oximetry, transcranial Doppler, a little bit more in depth than what we covered in the carotid lecture. Surgical intervention, a little bit about that. And then also our uh, venous reflux and insufficiency exams that we can perform. So we're going to focus a lot on this first PowerPoint about um, segmental pressures and what we do them for, how we do them, and kind of the importance of them, I guess we could say. So when we have arterial disease, we know that that's going to be some sort of blockage in the artery. That's pretty much the only disease that we're going to be talking about, some sort of stenosis or occlusion of the artery. Now we can perform Doppler segmental pressures of the upper extremities, but we're mainly looking at the information that the lower extremities are going to give us. So it's going to be a way that we can assess the presence and severity of that arterial blockage. And we use blood pressure cuffs to help us monitor how pressure affects the arterial waveforms at specific levels. So we're using multiple different blood pressure cuffs throughout this exam. We're placing them in specific locations on the patient's arm or leg. Now we're also going to use the Doppler segmental pressures in combination with Doppler velocity or volume pulse waveform. So depending on how a facility performs these segmental pressures, you may use an ultrasound machine to help guide you, but you're usually just going to be using a volume pulse waveform. So we're usually just going to rely on what the waveform looks like on our very basic machine. So some places you're using Doppler velocity with an actual ultrasound image associated with it, but usually we're doing these without an associated ultrasound visual. There are some limitations to doing these exams. So we cannot distinguish the precise level of where the disease is happening between the two different segments of where we have the blood pressure cuffs. So basically if we have a blood pressure cuff up in the high thigh and then one in the lower thigh. If there's a blockage that's occurring in between those locations, we can't really pinpoint like down to a centimeter of where that blockage is happening. So we can say it's happening above a certain level, below a certain level or at a certain level. We can't really say it is specifically happening right here. Calcified vessels, as we know with atherosclerosis, with plaque, that is going to make this exam almost completely inaccurate. So if our patient has really severe diabetes, high cholesterol, and stage renal disease, as we know, calcium comes from our kidneys, that's really going to calcify our vessels, and that's going to make it much harder for our blood pressure cuffs to apply pressure to the arteries. As we know, when we're trying to compress a vein, it's a lot easier to compress a vein than it is an artery, right? So now we're expecting blood pressure cuffs to compress an artery, but now they're calcified. So think about how much pressure is going to be needed to compress an artery, never mind a calcified one. So we're going to get these abnormally high Doppler pressure readings because of that calcification. <clears throat> 
congestive heart failure is also going to result in a decreased ABI reading. We'll talk about ABIs. It's a little bit more of a basic version of Doppler segmental pressures. It stands for ankle brachial index. And then also improper cuff size can uh, produce abnormal pressure readings. And also our patients can get vertigo. We have to have our patient laying uh, completely supine. So we need to make sure that if they are feeling dizzy, uh, that we can address them as quickly as possible. So here are our Doppler segmental machines, or sometimes people just call them ABI machines. These are not like an ultrasound machine, as you can tell. They are not going to produce a diagnostic ultrasound picture, and all we're going to get on them is going to be a waveform. So if you've ever been in the hospital or you've ever been hooked up to like a blood pressure cuff reading, that's what's going to come across the screen. You're really kind of just going to see that normal waveform, boop, boop, boop boop coming across the screen. We're not going to see a picture of a vessel. We're not going to have color. We're not going to have like pulse wave Doppler on. It's a very basic reading machine. You'll also see both of these machines have printers. We print those waveforms and we hand those to the cardiologist or the radiologist, depending on who's reading for our vascular exam. So I just wanted you guys to see uh, how very different these machines are than the ultrasound machine. Picture on the left-hand side, you could actually see the ultrasound machine in the corner. So we keep these all in the same department in the vascular world. So how do we actually perform these? We're going to spend the majority of the conversation about Doppler segmental pressures talking about the legs. Like I said, upper extremity segmental pressures, we're not really doing them. The only time we're taking a pressure of the upper extremity is to include it in an ache ankle brachial index or an ABI. So we're really kind of getting one waveform of our brachial artery and that's pretty much it. Then we're going to use it to compare to our lower extremity readings. So talking about our lower extremity, our technique, patient, supine, they have to be laying down for a minimum of 20 minutes. We need their heart to get down to a base level heart rate. Our legs need to be at the level of the heart so there's no hydrostatic pressure working on the arteries. And we need to make sure that our blood pressure cuffs are the appropriate size for our patient. We don't want to have them too big, too small. We want to make sure that our cuffs are placed straight on the extremity. So regardless of how that patient's thigh is shaped, they are straight on the patient's leg. We also do not want to place a blood pressure cuff over a bony structure. So we're not putting a cuff on top of the kneecap. We're not putting a cuff right at the ankle with all of our malleoli hanging off our ankle. We're keeping it away from bony structures. We're putting our cuff on snugly so that it doesn't um, shift. We're also making sure that we have the bladder, uh, the cuff bladder over the artery. So we want to make sure that where we're going to get the reading from is placed at the location of where the artery is. So along the medial aspect of the patient's leg. We also want to make sure that the width of our cuff should be 20% greater than the diameter of the limb. So you're going to see these blood pressure cuffs are really, really long. And that's because we need to make sure that they're going to wrap all the way around with enough room for all of our patients. We are then going to be using the continuous wave Doppler feature that is on those machines. Like we said, with our machines, we're not getting an ultrasound image. Sometimes we can, some places you can, depending on the equipment, but we're thinking in a world where you're not getting a diagnostic ultrasound image. Think back to physics, continuous wave Doppler. This is saying it's constantly sending and constantly receiving right? So we're not going to rely on that for any useful diagnostic image. We're using continuous wave Doppler to help us find our arteries without any imaging assistance. So when we're performing this, I kind of want to go, I kind of want to go forward one slide here and then we'll go back. So this is what your patient's going to look like. There's a three cuff method or a four cuff method. Eh, there's pros and cons to both of them. So you can see we have the cuffs bilaterally, away from the joints, away from the bones. They're nice and straight on the patient. And you can see that those cuffs are hooked up to the machine. So the pressure from the machine, the air from the machine is gonna come through these tubes and it's going to inflate those blood pressure cuffs. Now we're gonna be holding a continuous wave transducer depending on our site's protocol down either in the ankle or in the DPA of the toe. We need to make sure that we are on the right artery. So if we're using an ankle artery, 
we need to make sure that I'm in the PTA versus the pero artery or I'm in the pero artery versus the PTA. So which way am I angling? Am I angling posterior? I'm angling posterior to that ankle bone or that ankle joint, I'm gonna get the pero. If I'm angling anterior, I'm gonna get the PTA. Okay, or if I'm coming right here, I know I'm gonna get my ATA. If I'm coming right here, I'm gonna get my DPA. So depending on the site's protocol, you are going to keep your continuous wave Doppler in that specific location of the artery in the foot or the ankle, depending on protocol. Now, as our machine starts to inflate at certain segments, we're gonna notice that the waveform that we hear is going to start to change. And we're gonna be able to visualize those changes, document those changes and measure those changes. So let's go back a slide here. So we said we have a three cuff method and a four cuff method. Either way, these are gonna be done bilaterally. We always are gonna have one cuff on the arm. That's to get our brachial reading. We kind of compare everything to the brachial reading. Like I said, that's really all we're doing in the upper extremity. We are then, depending on our three cuff method or our four cuff method, are going to use either four blood pressure cuffs or three in the leg. If we're doing four, we're gonna have one high thigh, above the knee, below the knee, and at the ankle. If we have a three cuff, we're just gonna have one on the thigh, one below the knee, and one at the ankle. We still wanna make sure that our cuffs are long enough to reach all the way across our patient. So that is going to be that difference between the three cuff and the four cuff method. Now, of course, if we're used to doing a four cuff method and we have a patient who comes in and she is four foot eight, we are not going to be doing a four cuff method, right? Because her thigh is not gonna be long enough to fit two cuffs on. So we're gonna modify and drop down to a three cuff method. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, there are gonna be some pros and cons. Like we said, when we are doing a two thigh cuff method, so a four cuff method, it's gonna give us the information a little bit more precisely on where arterial disease is occurring, right? Because we have two different levels of readings that we're going to get by using two different cuffs. So now our one thigh cuff, our three cuff method, it's not gonna help us to determine a more precise level of where that disease is occurring, but it's gonna have more of an accurate pressure reading. So we can assume that the pressure reading that we get from a three cuff method is going to be a little bit more accurate, but it's not gonna help us to pinpoint the level of disease. When we have a four cuff method, so we have two thigh cuffs, it's going to artificially elevate that blood pressure in the thigh because we're doing two consecutive readings in that thigh. We're applying pressure to that thigh artery two times in a row. So we're gonna make it a little bit higher than it would be if we were just taking one reading. So if that, that makes, hopefully that makes some sense with my explanation. Also, as our limb girth increases, so the thicker our thigh becomes, the more pressure we are going to have to apply to those cuffs. So our pressure readings are going to increase as well. You have to think about how much force is needed to compress an artery. So now if you have an abnormally thickened thigh or an a really, really super thick thigh, you're gonna need even more pressure to get through that soft tissue to compress the artery. So it's not gonna necessarily mean that there is disease occurring we just need to anticipate that we're going to see higher pressure readings. Okay, so some more kind of technicalities when we're performing these exams. Like we said, we're using a continuous wave Doppler transducer. This is going to be specific to the ABI machine or the segmental pressure machine. It's gonna be eight to 10 megahertz. We're holding it at a degree of angulation to the vessel that our protocol states. So depending on if we are using the PTA, the PEROA, the ATA, or the DPA, we still need to have a degree of angulation. If we hold this transducer completely perpendicular, well, we know from physics, we're not gonna get an accurate waveform. So we need to have a degree of angulation to how we hold that probe. We are also going to typically be using an automatic cuff inflator that's going to come from our machine. There are some old school places that use handheld blood pressure cuffs. 
I don't know how you could ever accurately perform this exam doing it in a handheld fashion while you're also trying to hold a continuous wave Doppler probe. Like it, that's just archaic to me. So most places are going to be using machines that have automatic cuff inflators associated with them like we saw previously. And then we're going to go in a specific order of how we take our pressure. We're going to take our brachial pressure first, get that down. That's kind of our baseline that we're going to compare our information to. And then we work our way up the leg. So we start at the ankle. We then go below knee, above knee, if we're using a four cuff method. And then we have the high thigh. So remember, above the knee and high thigh are both going to be the two thigh cuff methods. So this is the process that we would inflate or apply pressure to the cuffs in this order. Now, while we're inflating the cuffs, while pressure is being associated to those arteries, we're still Dopplering. So we found our artery, whether it's usually going to be uh, the PTA or the DPA. Some places will use the ATA, some places will use the PERO. If you really can't find the DPA or the PTA, you can use those two, but we're usually going to be using the DPA or the PTA. So while you find that artery, you're holding your probe there, you're telling your automatic cuff inflator to inflate. Say we're starting off at our ankle and we're inflating that ankle cuff. You're going to hear whoosh, 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 whoosh. You're going to hear your normal arterial waveform. You're going to see your normal arterial waveform. And then all of a sudden, as that artery starts to respond to that pressure that's compressing it, you're going to see that waveform starts to weaken and eventually it completely stops flow. So that's going to be very important. That's gonna be the information that we're looking for. So once we see the cessation of arterial flow, the arterial flow stops on our screen, we don't hear it, it's gone, we don't see it. We keep inflating the cuff another 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury of pressure. We keep going and then we let the pressure go. And as we let the pressure go, it's going to take a few seconds, but we're slowly going to start to hear that arterial waveform come back. The first thump that we hear after it comes back is going to indicate systolic pressure. That is what we have to measure. We have to measure that time between when the flow stopped and when we heard that first audible noise. When we hear it, it's not necessarily when we're going to see it. We may not see it until a second after we hear it. So we need to mark where we hear it on our machine. That's going to be what we are looking for. Now we're saving, we're documenting all of those times and those pressures, right? Because we need to say, well, the ankle stopped blood flow at I don't know, say 150 millimeters of mercury, I kept going to 170 millimeters of mercury. I let my pressure go. And then I heard my waveform come back at 140 millimeters of mercury. So we need to know the relationships of all of those pressures and then the time it took that systolic pressure to occur again. We do not want to have to repeat these pressures because that is going to all elevate the overall readings, right? Because we're putting strain on the cardiovascular system. The arterial system is going to react to all of this extreme pressure. So we need to make sure we wait. We wait at least a minute before we repeat it. We also wait at least a minute before we perform the next one. We need our cardiovascular system to kind of drop back down to its baseline. So here is what we should be doing and here is what is typically going to occur on your machine. Now this is a modern type of waveform. I'm not really sure what the color scale indicates on the side here, but on the left-hand side, this is what our transducer should look like. See that angulation? We're really coming in on the steep angle, about a 60 degree angle to that PTA along the medial aspect of the ankle. We have our blood pressure cuff around that ankle, a little bit higher away from the bone. So as we inflate that cuff, we're keeping our transducer right at that level of the artery, and then we're gonna watch that flow disappear once we apply a certain amount of pressure. Now, if we're looking at the picture on the right-hand side, here's our normal art arterial waveforms, right? And here we start applying pressure. Cuffs are inflating, whoop, inflating. Look what's happening to our waveform. It's dropping, it's weakening, 
kind of stops right about here, right? But we still keep increasing. And then we say, okay, we can slowly let that pressure go. We're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. We heard a thump here and we didn't see a true waveform until a second after. But we documented where we heard that thump and that's saying that at 133 millimeters of mercury, systolic pressure returned to that level of the arterial system. Okay, so what do we do with all this information? How do we calculate all this information? Like, what do we care about this? So we're calculating the pressures that we are receiving from these, re these readings, and we are, in a basic sense, putting that as an ankle brachial index. So we're taking that pressure reading from the brachial up in the arm, and then we're comparing it to the ankle. Now, you're like, okay, well, what about the below the knee, above the knee, high thigh? Like, what about all of those? Like, how come we don't have a thigh brachial index? We're going to see the drastic difference in pressure readings between the ankle and the brachial. And yes, we do use the rest of the information for other diagnostic purposes, but we're basically going to start with the calculation of the ABI. So it's done on each leg, but we're taking it of the highest brachial pressure. So if our left arm had a higher brachial pressure reading than our right arm, we're gonna use the left arm to calculate the index. So comparing the right ankle to the left brachial and comparing the left ankle to the left brachial depending on what these ratios come back as, so taking the ankle reading by the brachial reading, if it is greater than or equal to one, it's normal. We wanna have a high index. If it is 0 0.9 to one, mm, that's a little bit borderline, a little, a little bit too close to normal for comfort. So we're gonna question maybe some sort of minimal disease going on. Now, if we're 0.5 to 0.9, we're gonna have clonic adhesion. Less than 0.5 is going to be severe arterial disease where we have consistent rest pain. And any time we see a decrease in greater than 20 to 30 millimeter, millimeters of mercury between two levels is going to suggest significant obstruction. So if the pressure reading at the above knee cuff is say 110, and then the pressure reading at the high thigh cuff is say, I don't know, 70 millimeters of mercury, we are going to say, okay, there is some sort of blockage that is occurring between these two levels. So we're talking about a 20 to 30 degree decrease in pressure or 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury decrease in pressure between two consecutive levels. So it's not between the ankle and the high thigh. It's not between the high thigh and the below knee. It's between two consecutive levels, two levels, one after the other. We're also gonna use interpretation of our waveforms that we're getting from our readings and the uh, times and velocities in addition to the ABI information. So we'll kind of talk about that a little bit further when we get into plethysmography. So plethysmography cares a little bit more about the additional readings at the uh, below knee, above knee, and high thigh. But we are still using that information to see what our waveforms are like and what our times look like. So now exercise is going to have a massive effect on how we would perform this exam. So we need to perform this exam at rest. We're keeping our patient supine 20 minutes before we even begin. Sometimes there is a need for us to have the patient exercising during this exam. So we will have our patient walk on a treadmill at a slight incline, 10 degree incline at 1.5 miles per hour for five minutes or until the symptoms cause the patient to stop. So depending on what we're looking for, it's either five minutes or until our patient is like, oh my gosh, I need to stop right now. That could be three minutes, that could be two minutes, that could be 11 minutes. This is going to cause reactive hyperemia of the peripheral vascular system. So it's basically going to say like, I'm getting this this reaction to my exercise is causing this disease in this moment because of exercise right like so when we learned about claudication versus pseudoclaudication one is going to be indicated 
with neuropathy or um, arthritis or um, orthopedic conditions, whereas the other is going to be basically a true arterial obstruction that is occurring. So it's going to have this reaction on the entire peripheral vascular system while we're exercising. So we're not gonna be able to miss that. The technique we're gonna be doing our pressures taken immediately after exercise. We're taking our ankles, uh, our symptomatic ankle first and then moving to our brachial. So a little bit different than how we would perform a non-exercise ABI or segmental pressure. If it's going to be a normal reading, meaning that there is not arterial disease, we are going to see the ABI increase immediately after exercise in comparison to the pre-exercise. And then if it's abnormal, we're going to see the ABI decreasing. Uh, pressure is going to be taken two minute, every two minutes until the pre-exercise pressure occurs. So if regardless if it's normal or abnormal, right, if it's normal, our ABI is going to increase. If it's abnormal, our ABI is going to decrease. Either way, we're still taking pressures every two minutes until we get back to that pre-exercise pressure. And of course, we're documenting how long that takes. Uh, so of course, there's going to be contraindications to performing uh, segmental pressures with exercise. Of course, if our patient can't walk or exercise safely, we're not going to be doing that. Uh, there is an option for kind of mimicking the effects of exercise on the peripheral system. So it's very uncomfortable. It is slightly barbaric, but basically what we do is at, this is usually gonna be done only as an ABI. So only our ankle and our brachial. We're usually not gonna be doing this for, you know, above the knee, below the knee and high thigh. We're not gonna be doing a full Doppler segmental on these patients. We're just aiming to get the information that we need. So we are going to inflate the ankle cups 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury beyond the highest brachial pressure. So if our brachial pressure on the left side is 130, 140 on the right side, we're going to increase both ankles pressure to at least 160, if not 170 on both sides. We're keeping that pressure on for three to five minutes. So we're basically cutting off all blood supply to their feet for five minutes. It's going to produce uh, intermittent ischemia and vasodilation in that foot, so distal to that ankle cuff. It is extremely uncomfortable. Their toes are going to turn blue. They're going to turn white. They're going to be in a lot of pain. So this is something that you know, we're not really doing too often. We're not even doing exercise segmental pressure, pressures that often because it's like, all right, well, you know, you either have arterial disease or you don't. And there are other ways for us to find that out rather than, you know, taking pressures every two minutes after you exercise or doing this sort of barbaric um, mimic of exercise on the system by cutting off blood supply to your feet. Like it's a little bit unnecessary when we can just do other types of diagnostic imaging to get the answers that we need. So upper extremity, not going to be talking about this uh, too much, but it's going to be the same sort of concept. We're usually only doing a two cuff method, one in the upper arm, one on the lower arm. And then we can actually take waveforms um, at specific levels as well. So clavian, axillary, brachial, radial, ulnar. Now these were actually moving our probe. So if we're doing our uh, radial and ulnar, we want to keep that down at the wrist as we inflate our forearm cuff. If we are doing our um, brachial axillary, I'm sorry, I should include brachial um, in the forearm. No, sorry. Taking brachial at the antecubital fossa. Um, don't mind me guys. You have your forearm cuff where you would inflate that and you would be Dopplering at the radial and the ulnar of the wrist. You then have your brachial cuff, right, in your upper arm, where you would be Dopplering your brachial at the antecubital fossa. Subclavian and axillary, we can't compress that. So that you're just taking your Doppler waveforms and your velocities of those vessels. They're not really gonna respond if you compress the brachial cuff. 
So interpretation, a little bit different. Instead of looking for a 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury uh, decrease in pressure, we're kind of decreasing that a little bit. So anything um, 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury, it's going to really represent some sort of upper extremity arterial blockage. Again, not very common, not performing these often. Next, we have our Allen test. So this is actually like a kind of cool test that some clinicians will still perform. So it's an optional sort of way to test the upper extremity arteries um, in the sense of patency. So is the patient having finger numbness, tingling, turning blue, turning white? If so, is it arterial? Is it, you know, um, nerve? Is it neuropathy? Is it arthritis? So there's one way that we can perform this to see if it's vascular. So basically what we do is we palpate the radial artery on the patient's wrist and we compress it and we compress it and we hold it and the patient is going to clench their fist and they're going to relax it. So they're going to clench and relax, clench and relax. And we're still compressing while this is happening. Now, when the patient's hand is clenched and we're compressing, their hand is going to lose color and turn pale. So this is going to say that if we release our hand and we're still compressing, we want to see the color return. This means that the ulnar artery is taking over the majority of flow in the palmar arch while we're compressing the radial artery. If color does not return when we release our hand during compression, then that's going to indicate that our ulnar artery is not working properly. And it's going to indicate that all the flow to our hand is being relied upon by the radial artery. So again, repeating here, we are compressing the patient's radial artery. We are having them clench it's going to turn pale, lose color. When they release their hand or relax their hand, their hand should have their color return because the ulnar artery is going to be taking over some of that flow. If the color does not return, it's going to indicate that all of the flow is responsible from that radial artery and our ulnar artery is not working properly. We also have a finger stress test. So this is kind of done with cold sensitivity. This is going to really help to determine Raynaud's a little bit more so. Uh, we can do this with and without sort of waveforms um, or diagnostic guidance. Usually we're going to um, be submerging the patient. So we can do this with and without actual cold testing. We're usually going to do this with cold testing because it's like, all right, well, we're trying to figure out if the patient has rain odds, so let's mimic cold sensitivity. So we're going to submerge the patient's hand in cold water for at least three minutes. Right after we take their hand out while their hand is still nice and frigid, we're going to be doing waveforms and pressures um, in a similar way that we would be doing the upper extremity, but we're going to focus mainly on the radial and the ulnar uh, segmental pressures. We're also going to document their symptoms. So again, not performing this too often. And usually this is something that we can do clinically to determine if a patient actually has Raynaud's without having to hook them up to an entire segmental pressure machine. Um, here's the information for interpreting uh, a finger brachial index. If you were to do the finger stress test, pretty straightforward. Uh, and I should say that these are... Um, this is normal appearance here at the bottom. So before we um, before we compress, sorry, before we it's so loud outside of my office, I can't even focus right now. I don't know if you guys hear that. Um, so before we actually do the segmental pressures, before we submerge them in cold, this is going to be their resting waveform. Immediately after we take their hand out of cold, this is normal. So we're, it's normal to lose that arterial waveform while the hand is still cold. But if after five minutes, that resting waveform does not come back and it still looks like this, okay, well then we got to question some sort of blockage going on. Okay, next we have plethysmography. So this is using the Doppler segmental pressures in combination with volume displacement. 
So there is Doppler segmental brushers, there's plethysmography, and there's also photoplethysmography, which is a little bit different. So plethysmography, also known as volume plethysmography, your registry likes to go back and forth between those two terms. We use this with the Doppler segmental pressures, like I said earlier. It's going to help us to truly identify and diagnose arterial disease. It can help us to determine the functional aspects of that vascular disease. So like, is it intermittent ischemia? Is it kind of uh, constant severe rest pain? Is it an acute blockage? Uh, do we have collaterals? Do we not? It's also going to help us to kind of localize the level of obstruction, whereas our Doppler segmental pressures can't necessarily do that precisely. And it's also going to help us to assess results of medical or exercise therapy. So if our patient is undergoing arterial treatments for whatever condition, we can continue to do plethysmography and Doppler segmental pressures to see if that therapy is actually Actually helping them. Now, PPG is used um, on very small tissues and vessels. So we use PPG to evaluate the fingertips, the toes, and penile pressures, which we'll talk about in a second. And then there are some limitations to plethysmography. So we cannot specify a single vessel uh, because it's going to measure the volume changes in a certain segment. So if we have, say, like a duplicate artery in the leg, well, we can't specify if there's disease happening in one versus the other because it's going to take volume readings as well as pressure readings from the Doppler segmental portion of it from that specific level. It also cannot distinguish major vessels from collaterals. That's that same concept. You have multiple vessels happening in a, in a certain level. We can't determine which one we're really talking about. And of course, obesity is going to limit the performance and the accuracy of this. So what is this? How is this different? How does this work with Doppler segmental pressures? It's extremely similar, and we're usually doing these at the same time. It's just collecting different information from that segmental pressure. So instead of filling the cuffs 20 to 30 millimeters beyond when the flow stops, a fixed amount of air is going to be inflated into the cuffs. So whatever the system is going to whatever your protocol is, whatever your facility guidelines are, we are going to tell the machine, okay, insert, um, inflate into 150 millimeters of mercury. And then we're going to see what happens to that waveform. So we're usually doing these at the same level, one at a time with Doppler segmental pressures. It's important to remember that anytime we're doing something more than once at a certain cuff level, we need to wait between each. So we would inflate the cuff to a certain level, a certain amount of air. Now that may not make the artery completely stop. So that's something that we're actually looking for. We're looking to see how does this artery respond to this amount of pressure? What does that look like? And that's going to give us different information than, okay, when does flow return after I've made its flow completely stop from pressure? So instead of interpreting the pressure levels, we're interpreting the waveforms of the artery responding to a certain pressure level. So here is going to be our specific readings. So this is saying that we are applying 172. So typically we're going to use um, the highest brachial, right? So it's going to be our right side. So we are applying 172 millimeters of mercury to every segment bilaterally of the legs. Depending on what is happening in those waveforms, we can, we can tell, okay, this is abnormal or this is normal. Now, if we look at the left leg, that left leg, all those waveforms are pretty nice, right? Nice and triphasic, nice and consistent, nice and regular. All of them are triphasic, even down to the down to the toe. Like the toe still has a nice consistent waveform. We're not going to get triphasic waveforms in the toes different than the DPA. We're actually taking the PPG sensor and putting it on the tip of the toe. So we're picking up very small vessels that are not going to display triphasic waveforms. Now, if we look at the right side, well, none of them are triphasic, right? It's literally telling us monophasic, 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 monophasic. So that's going to say that pretty much this entire right leg has some sort of abnormal arterial 
disease going on. Now, it may not be severe because if it was severe, well, then we'd see very weakened monophasic waveforms. We're still getting kind of strong monophasic waveforms, but it's not responding to that pressure as well as the left side is. So that way we can indicate mm, something's going on. Okay, so PPG, like we said, we use this for our um, very distal small tissues. It's an actual skin sensor that is going to detect subcutaneous blood flow, and it's going to record the pulsations as waveforms. So the sensor is going to use infrared light to send into the tissues. It's going to receive the reflected backscatter from that infrared light, and that's how it's going to be able to pick up changes in the waveforms of those vessels. Very useful for ischemic tissues. So if we have blue toe syndrome, we have necrotic toes, we have very bad diabetes, we need to make sure we know how to use a PPG sensor. We have to tape these to patients' toes, we have to keep them stable, and we have to keep them covered. So you have to put a towel over them because the infrared light can go out and scatter and pick up a lot of different things in the surrounding room. So you wanna make sure that you put a towel over it so that it's nice and dark. This is our PPG sensor, this little guy right here, putting it right at that tip of the toe. And we'll have like a little cover. Usually you see how it's nice and dark. It's gonna go right over the toe to hold that in place. Um, if you worked at low budget hospitals like myself, you are taping that sensor to the toe and you're covering it with the towel. Um, here we can again use this um, up in our, our fingers. If you've ever had your pulse ox done, very similar sort of technology. So the interpretation of plethysmography, so we're really looking at the difference in um, waveforms and the appearance of those waveforms. So we know that we always want to see a nice triphasic waveform, but we're also applying pressure to it. So it's okay if that waveform changes a little bit, but we're still looking for a rapid upstroke, a very sharp systolic peak, and a reflected wave for diastole. Now, anytime we see anything where we're starting to lose those appearances or those characteristics, that's where we're going to say that mm, this vessel is not responding to this pressure as well as it should. The volume of flow getting through this vessel is probably not what we want it to be. So again, here's what we're going to be getting as for our readings. Nice, normal, consistent waveforms representing triphasic flow is what we want. This is not showing triphasic flow on the right side because this is the digital uh, PPG reading that we're getting, we're not going to get tri we're not going to get triphasic form in the digits anyway. Uh, but anything higher than the digits DPA and up, we want to be getting triphasic. Next, we have penile imaging. So there are different there are two different types of penile imaging: non-invasive and invasive. Non-invasive is also known as non-imaging. So this is useful in the diagnosis of impotence. This is going to be related to peripheral vascular insufficiency. So basically the patient is not getting enough blood supply to the um, genital region. With these exams, whether it be non-invasive or invasive, penile imaging is going to bring a, an extremely high level of anxiety. High level of anxiety for you high level of anxiety for the physician who has to inject the patient's penile tissue with medication, an extremely high level of anxiety for the patient himself. So this is something that we are keeping staff to an absolute minimum. It is also something that you need to be comfortable with. And if at any moment you feel like you are not comfortable or you feel like you are in a vulnerable situation with the patient, you need to leave immediately. But it's something that we need to make sure that we are communicating effectively and we are putting the patient at ease. Now, with this non-imaging or this non-invasive type, it's kind of it's kind of like a play on words because we're literally injecting them. So we're seeing like I, I, that to me, that's pretty invasive, um, but we're not really relying on imaging for this. We're really relying on just our PPG waveforms. Um, and some of our waveforms up in those higher vessels and those pelvic vessels of the, of the common femoral artery. Uh, so we want to make sure our patient is supine, modest draping. Obviously, they can't have underwear on. We're placing pressure cuffs to get an ABI. So we're just doing one on the ankle, one on the um, upper arm. Poor arterial flow to the lower extremity may affect penile arterial inflow. So that's really what we're going to be looking for. So we need to look at the uh, waveforms of the CFA, so the common femoral artery, um, 
and then also down in the PTA and the DPA as well. So if we're having poor arterial flow to the legs, well, then we might as well check them at the ankle. Uh, penile pressure is going to be obtained with that PPG sensor, so we need to make sure that that is secured on that penile tissue, and typically these are going to be specifically made cuffs that can go around the circumference um, and stay in place while we perform the exam. So interpretation of this, we're doing a penile brachial index. Uh, we have our numbers right there that we can evaluate. And here is our sensor that we would have for this associated exam. And then this would be, um, we would move the cuff up to the thigh if we were really kind of doing a Doppler segmental of the common femoral, but usually we're just gonna do an AVI for them and then compare with the PPG reading. Then we also have the invasive aspect of penile imaging. So this is also known as with imaging. So we're using our machine to help us um, document the cavernous arteries of the penile tissue. They, I do have a diagram um, in a few slides, so we'll look at that again in a second, but we're actually documenting those arteries with images. We're obtaining a velocity. Uh, we're also looking at the dorsal vein of the penile tissue as well. We are then going to be injecting the patient um, into the lateral aspect of the proximal penile tissue. It's going to induce an erection, so we need to make sure that we are monitoring the time that it takes post-injection, and then also how long is this patient being subjected to the medically induced erection. So we need to make sure that one to two minutes post-injection, we are repeating the, the um, images with the medical induced erection, but then also, if the patient has a medically induced erection for longer than three hours, he needs to go to the hospital. So we need to get immediate medical attention if that is the case. So although the patient may just want to be like, I am done, I'm leaving, I'm out of here, we need to make sure that that patient is okay within three hours after that injection. I should, uh, hold on guys, so this non-invasive, this is this patient care section is obviously talking about both types of penile imaging. We don't do injections with non-invasive penile imaging. And the only reason why I got confused on that is because I've only ever done the injection. So we're not injecting with non-invasive, which would make sense in non-imaging. We're just relying on those waveforms and those pressures. And then for invasive, of course, we are injecting, waiting, and then repeating those um, images afterwards. So here's our interpretation of the invasive type of penile imaging. So we want to see that that cavernous artery diameter increases post-injection. That would mean that that's allowing for more arterial flow to get into the penile tissue. We're also going to see an increase in our PSV measurements of our artery of our cavernous arteries. We want to see at least an increase of 30 centimeters per second. Um, anything less than that is going to be abnormal. And then our dorsal vein velocity does not, if it does not increase, is going to be suggestive of a venous leak. So that's saying that that vein is not working properly and it's not returning as much blood flow as it's getting from that injection, from that higher medically induced erection cavernous artery increase. So here we have our diagram. You can see we have our two cavernous arteries. They're kind of towards the middle of the penile tissue. And then we have our... Um, And then we have our dorsal uh, vein sort of on top of the two. So if you're looking at a transverse section, you're going to see the you're going to see the dorsal vein a little bit more anterior on your screen, and then you're going to see cavernous and cavernous. And we're not really evaluating in SAG. We're we're kind of relying on transverse for this. That way we know precisely which vessels we're looking at evaluating. So a lot of information, a lot of exams that you guys are probably not going to be performing, um, a lot of exams that are kind of getting uh, filtered out. Like we said, the Doppler segmental pressures with exercise, not really doing those too often unless you work in a urology office or in a hospital that has a large urolo urology uh, department. You're not going to be doing penile imaging. Uh, you're not going to be doing upper extremity Doppler segmental pressures. So there's a lot on here that you need to know for the class. You need to know for your vascular registry. Um, 
but there's not going to be a lot that you can apply clinically unless you're working in these very specific places. Your vascular registry is heavy on Doppler segmental pressures and plethysmography. So if there's anything that you can take away from this, please make sure you have a good understanding of those topics.